Our scripture reading this evening will come from 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. All right, it's good to see everybody tonight. Hope you have your Bibles with you. We're not going to hang out in 1 Timothy 3 too awful long. But we are going to start a series tonight on church organization. We're going to start with the eldership. And this is something, you know, we've been doing this overview on Wednesday nights of the different books of the Bible. And we did 1 Timothy. It's been a few weeks now. But as I kind of went, as we kind of did that overview, I think, I think we spent two weeks overviewing 1 Timothy because we talked about elders and deacons one night at length. And so since that time, I've been putting some thoughts together and some material together. I think this is a subject that we need to address like once a year, not necessarily on any certain schedule, but thinking of what a congregation needs to hear and things we need to be reminded of and our current elders and perhaps men who would serve in the future as elders, you can benefit from this and I hope that you do. So I thought about how to handle the material and what the Bible says about it, because the Bible says a lot about elders. I think next week when we study, we're going to talk about some things from the Old Testament, because Israel, the nation of Israel had elders, and there's quite a bit said about them. The Egyptians had elders. Pharaoh had elders, we learn in Genesis chapter 50. The Moabites, all of these nations, the Ammonites, they all had elders. And then we come to the New Testament, we read about the establishment of the church, and we read that the church is to have elders. And so tonight what I want us to do as we think about this is just look at some terms, lay down some groundwork, and then we'll go from there in future lessons. The, the New Testament, the, the word we use most often is elders. And the word in the New Testament that is used most often is the same. It's just, I, I guess, among churches of Christ, this is just the, the nature of it, you might say. Yes, we have elders. Does this congregation have elders or does that? And that's just the term that is... I would say, most familiar to us. Now, you look at your New Testament, and the first time that word is used in connection with the church, and I want to look at this, is Acts chapter 11. So go ahead and turn your Bibles over there. Acts chapter 11. We typically, and I have done this myself, and there's nothing wrong with this, but we typically want to jump right into 1 Timothy 3 or Titus chapter 1. We'll get there. But like I said, tonight I want to lay some groundwork for what Scripture Reveals to us about elders, you know, the church is established some years before this, and this, like I said, is the first time in the text, the biblical text, that we read about the church having elders. There's a prophecy given here in Acts 11 uh, by a prophet named Agabus. He signifies by the Spirit that there's going to be a famine. King James says dearth. There's going to be a famine, and it comes to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. This is, this is going to take place somewhere in about A.D. 51 or 52, and we know that from secular history. But it's something prophesied of, and verse 29, then the disciples, okay, so the church is going to take action based on this prophecy that is revealed by the Spirit. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So you ask yourself a question. Why would they send it to the elders? Well, inherent in the eldership, biblically speaking, is authority. And so from this point on in Acts chapter 11, uh, well, let's, let's turn to the next one. Look at Acts chapter 14. You see the church, my point was that I was making was, you see the elders of congregations, well, first of all, being appointed, elders being appointed, and that's here in Acts chapter 14, verse 23, but then also making decisions. So churches have been established on 
you know, based on the mission work of Paul, they have decided to go back and visit some of the congregations and kind of build them up. And as they do that, Acts 14, 23 says that when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commanded them to the, commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And so part of the building up of the local churches that were established during these mission works, mission trips as we call them, was the, the forming of elderships in each, notice there, in every church. There's no biblical precedent. There's no biblical example of this concept of of an eldership or a singular man, group of men or whatever, ruling over like a region of churches. Um, that's, that's something that develops much later on in church history. But an interesting thing to think about, and this is revealed in Acts chapter 20. We may look at that in the future in these lessons. But Paul, as he's leaving Ephesus there in Acts chapter 20, one of, the, one of his warnings to that church is that the departures would come from among the eldership, the departures from the truth. Men shall arise from among yourselves, he says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 29. But early on, they're established. Elders make decisions of, of monetary concerns, Acts 11.30. They're established in every church. You get to Acts chapter 15, and there's this dis discussion of the Jews trying to bind circumcision and the law of Moses on Gentiles in order for them to be saved. You look at Acts 15 verse 5, it tells us that. Well, the elders of the church in Jerusalem and the apostles get together to discuss this. And there's a great discussion. There's a letter that's written to send up to these churches in Antioch, you know, north of Judea, north of Jerusalem, where Gentiles, where, where the congregations are prominently Gentile. And so notice here in Acts chapter 15, um, verse 2, okay, these false teachers have come in. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. That's what Acts chapter 15 records. Look down at verse 28. They come to a decision. And we need to note the source of this decision. The apostles are there. The elders are there. Paul and Barnabas. And this is, as it says there in verse 2, they had no small dissension. This is a pretty significant uh, turning point, you might say. I don't know if turning point's right, but a pretty significant event in the church, in the history of the early church. But notice Acts 15, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. One thing that we need to understand and appreciate in the existence of the early church is the presence of the, of the, I would, the way I would phrase it is the miraculous guidance of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus told his apostles right before he left the earth, he said, I'm going to leave. This is John 16, beginning in about verse 7. And it's going to be for your benefit that I leave, because when I leave, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and he will guide you into all truth. So in the early church, you have these men, these apostles who are guided by the Holy Spirit. These apostles are able to lay their hands on individuals and pass on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to Acts chapter 8. Some of those gifts were the gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom, that would be beneficial to an eldership. If you've served as an elder or if you are serving as an elder, it takes wisdom, doesn't it? Not just a knowledge of the biblical text, but wisdom from experience to make certain decisions. Anyway, Acts 15, 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Why do you think the apostolic decision here and the decision of the elders seemed good to the Holy Spirit too? Because they're guided by the Holy Spirit. They're not going to come to a decision that would be contrary to what the Holy Spirit would reveal to them. And so we cannot forget that. To lay upon you no greater burden than the necessary things. And again, that, getting into Jew and Gentile issues here, I don't want to talk about that. But all throughout Acts, you see after Acts 11.30, elders are mentioned. 1 Timothy chapter 4, if you read a King James Version, you're going to see this word presbytery. Timothy was told to... Um, to not neglect, not neglect the gift that had been given him by the, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Well, that's the same word that's translated elder in every other verse in the New Testament. And it should have been translated as elder there. Paul had laid his hands on Timothy. That's how the gifts are passed on, the miraculous abilities. And the elders were there when that happened. The elders 
in the church at Ephesus. Remember, Paul had left Timothy in Ephesus. We talked about that. Remember, he left Titus in Crete, and he left Timothy in Ephesus. And so you see all of that playing out in these other texts. Titus chapter 1, of course, talks about the... Much like 1 Timothy 3, although there are some variations in the requirements of an elder, James chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to look at all of those passages as we go through this series of lessons. The point here, the word that you and I use the most, and the word that the New Testament uses the, the most, is that. The, the elders of the church. Presbyteros is the term. And like I said, in one passage, it's translated as presbytery. And the rest of those passages, elder, singular, or elders. And it refers to a man who is older, one who is aged, or, depending upon context, it has to do with experience, which experience comes with being older and being aged. The next word in the New Testament, by, by order of how often it's used, is the term bishop and overseer. And if you looked at the scripture reading tonight that Garrett had for us, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Have you ever, we've heard, we've had this discussion, and I used to say this, and we'll talk about it when we get to 1 Timothy chapter 3, but I've often heard it said that the first desire, that the first qualification is desire. But I'm going to show you something from that text when we get there that that's not quite what it says. Because it says, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be. The qualifications start in verse 2. But the point is here, when we're talking about bishop, it's used several times, or overseer. Acts chapter 20, um, when Paul's talking to the elders at the church in Ephesus, he talks to them about their role throughout that text, beginning in verse 17. Get to verse 28, he said that they had been made overseers by the Holy Spirit. If an eldership or if a congregation has an eldership today and they're appointed scripturally, they are still made elders by the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit has revealed in Scripture what it takes for a man to be an elder, but also then what his role is in the local congregation as an elder. And that's something that's that's significant, I think, for our current elders to always keep in mind. And again, perhaps those men or younger men who are here who perhaps one day will serve in the role of as an elder of a local congregation. This is not some type of political appointment. It's not some type of power grab or anything like that. This is something that has been designed by the Holy Spirit for the function of the body of Christ in a local setting. If you meet the qualifications of an elder and you're willing to serve in that capacity, you serve as an example. Remember 1 Peter chapter 5, not as lords over the flock, but, but as examples. You have been made an elder by the Holy Spirit. By political, I mean it's not about, at least it shouldn't be about, you know, who your friends are in the local church. Well, such and such will, they want me to be, it's not anything about that. Serving as an elder in the local church is a, it's a great responsibility, but it's also a great blessing. And we need good, faithful elders in a local congregation. But Acts 20, 28 tells us that they're appointed by the Holy Spirit. We'll, we'll discuss that as we go throughout this series of lessons. Philippians 1.1 1, 1 talks about the church in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. To the saints at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. It's interesting. We have, I would say, the way the church has organized and um, driven itself through the years, they've, they've added a third category and the preachers. But the New Testament doesn't ever do that. In terms of church organization, you have the saints, the bishops, and the deacons. That's according to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, we've talked about that. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5, and let's look at this just quickly. 1 Peter chapter 5. And I've got verse 2 up here, but we'll look at the first two verses. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. So, this is a reference to Peter, being an elder in the a congregation. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God. Some of you may have a version that says shepherd. Some of you may have a version that says take care of the church of God. And that's what this word means in its, in, in its form as a verb. It's some action that you take. It's feeding, it's tending to, it's caring for. And that's precisely what we're talking about. 
um, in, in the next word that we're going to discuss. But notice here, you feed the church of God which is among you, but how do you do that? By taking the oversight. That's the word we're talking about right now. The bishop or the overseer. Look at that word there, the episkopos, scope. You hear that word scope in there? Epi is a preposition that means over, and scope means you're looking at. You're watching over a local congregation. And that's what an elder is. A watchman, one of the definitions is a superintendent. So you feed, kind of getting ahead of myself here, you're a pastor as an elder, and you do that by taking the oversight thereof. That's part of the work of an eldership. And so that's our next word here, pastor and shepherd. So we've got elder and presbyter. We've got what we just looked at, bishop and overseer. And now we have, on the next slide here, pastor or shepherd. You've got six terms in your English Bible that come from three Greek words. And all of these terms, one thing that we need to understand, and we'll talk about it here in just a minute more, but they're descriptive. They describe something being done. These are not religious titles. Anyway, let's think about pastors and shepherds. Since I've mentioned it a couple of times, let's go to Acts chapter 20. And we'll look at it with this particular point. Acts chapter 20. This passage is so helpful to us. You know, remember this morning, we talked about the, the living stones, the, the priesthood of every Christian, how every Christian is a priest in the, in the temple of God within the church, as we say, as the New Testament calls it. And there's no clergy laity system. That's very clear. You, you look at the religious world around us and you have different men in certain positions in denominationalism and you'll have some that are called pastors and some that are called bishops and some that are called elders and they're all, it's like they're broken up into different, different offices or different functions within the church. The New Testament, when it speaks of bishops, elders, pastors, overseers, shepherds, presbyters, it's talking about the same thing. These are not six different offices that exist. This is one office that exists. And all of these terms describe what's going on here. So Acts 20, I've had you turn there, really helps us see that. So look at Acts 20 and verse 17. And from Miletus he called, he sent to Ephesus and he called the elders of the church. That was the first word we looked at. Look at Acts 20 and verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That's the word we just looked at a moment ago, episkopos, superintend, oversight, to feed the church of God. That's the word we're looking at now. You've heard me say many times over the years, I'm not your pastor, and I'm not. Now, I teach and I feed you with the word of God, but the local elders here, they are our pastors. They're my pastors. They're your pastors. I'm not one of them. Uh, I don't serve in that position, if you will. So you've got elder, verse 17. You've got overseer, verse 28. And you've got feed in verse 28. That's all three of these words that we're already looking at. And they all describe something going on. Ephesians 4.11, if you look at a King James Version, uses the word pastors. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, feed the church of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. All of these terms are descriptive. It's a noun. Sometimes it's a noun in the New Testament. It's a shepherd. And we could look at a different, you know, different aspects of that work. You think of Psalm chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And what's involved in being a shepherd according to David in that chapter. But it's also used as a verb in the New Testament. And that's precisely what we're talking about here Feed the church of God which is among you. And this is what I was talking about earlier in verse 28. Over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. If a man meets the qualifications that are listed there in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 and, and 1 Peter 5. And he is, it's, it's kind of interesting to look at the discussions. What should we call it? Installed as an elder? Put up as an elder? Whatever word you choose to use. That man is made and has been made an elder by the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit's the one who has revealed all of this to us. So, what's the point? Well, the work described, that's what we're talking about tonight. 
We need to lay this groundwork because there is so much confusion in this, on this subject. The biblical words are nouns and verbs that describe things to be done not an office or a position to be held. I told you this morning, over, over the years, how many times people have come to me and say, what do I call you? <laughs> you, you know what to call me. And so the, these are not religious titles. Now, in, in the world of Christendom, let's just call it that, the world that, that believes that Jesus is the Son of God, there are distinctions made between these terms. And these are used as official titles for certain positions. But we have to, our concern, it's like 1 Peter 4.11 says, if you're going to speak, you need to speak as the oracles of God. We have to, we have to use biblical terms correctly. And so when we talk about the, the functions of an elder or a bishop or a pastor, we're not using that terminology in, in like a title. It's a description of things to be done at a local level. Oversight, tending to, caring for, making decisions based on wisdom because of age and experience, that's what we're dealing with. A second thought that I have here, an elder is a presbyter, is a bishop, is an overseer, is a shepherd, is a pastor. Biblically speaking, there is no distinction between these terms. And Acts 20 is, is case in point. 1 Peter 5 really does the same thing. Uh, as Peter talks about himself and then, the, and then the elders that were among this congregation that, to whom he was writing. There's no distinction. And so, it's a work being done by definition. So here we go. What, what's the point? Well, by definition, what are our elders? Our elders are aged or experienced men who superintend the church and care for the members of their flock. So, go back to 1 Peter chapter 5. I want to point this out to you. Surely you've seen it before, but since we're talking about it, we'll look at it again and then, and then wind down here. 1 Peter chapter 5. Again, another model that we see, not only are the names confused in the denominational world, as if these are different functions or different things to be done in the church, which they are not, but also this idea of, you know, how far does an elder's authority extend? And 1 Peter 5 answers this question for us. 1 Peter 5, 2 again. Feed the flock of God, next four words, which is among you. The church in the first century existed in quite a different um, environment than you and I exist in today. They had to struggle with Judaism, idolatry, you know, paganism. What is it that you and I battle against with the minds of people? Well, it's denominationalism. Unless we're talking about, let's say, a person who has no religious background at all, then you've got to deal with worldliness. But the thing that, that we have to deal with that really challenges us today is the existence of denominationalism and the confusion that reigns because of the existence of denominationalism. And, and the, the terms that we're talking about here tonight, these six words, the confusion, you just do a little research Spend a little time on Google. See what these words mean in the denominational world. And it's all kinds of different things. And yet the Bible is very clear. Feed the flock of God, which is among you. The elders of the Mammoth Spring Church of Christ, they have zero authority, let's say, at the Pilot Church of Christ. Or any other church of Christ that you can name. They have no authority there. Now, can they be in fellowship and, and cooperate with other congregations? Absolutely. There's no question about that. So long as they're doing things in line with Scripture. But the authority of an eldership is local. And the New Testament pattern for the existence of a congregation is local autonomy. A local, self-governing body of believers over which there are elders. And there are so many passages that we'll look at that talk about that type of work. So... One of the greatest needs that, that exists in the world today, and I, would, I guess I would say in the, in the world of the church, is good, qualified men to serve as elders. And we here, you know, talking to folks about the history of this congregation and, and what we have now, this, this congregation, I would say, has been blessed over the years with elders that 
are faithful and strong, and dependable, and we should be thankful for that because there are many places who maybe they have elders, but, well, there's this idea. Let me share this with you. There's this idea that, well, we don't have any elders here. We've got a few men that, you know, they're, they're so close to 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, and they just lack this one area. So let's go ahead and appoint them as elders, and maybe they'll work their way into that that, you know, last one or two areas that they really need to clean up. That's not scriptural. You, you don't appoint a man as an elder or as a deacon in hopes that he will become what the Bible requires him to be. And that's the point. When you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be. See, and from verse 2 then through verse 7 that, that Garrett read for us earlier, it's not, well, he's almost this and he'll get there one day if we just go ahead and appoint him. It's, he must be this. And so, a great need that we need, that a great need that we always have among a congregation is not only to currently have a good, solid, faithful eldership, but also to do what we're going to do with this series of lessons. Because, as far as I know, none of us are going to be here forever. And where will this congregation be in 20 years, 30 years? Or who knows, even less time than that. You never know. It's the nature of life. But we always need to have these things on our mind and always need to be concerned about the health of a local congregation, the health of her elders and deacons and, and the work that goes on there. But God's been very specific with His design for the church. And so, again, starting tonight, next few weeks we're going to cover elders, we're going to look at deacons, and then we'll, we'll look at some other things, too, in terms of local church um, work and organization. Well, it may be that there's somebody here tonight who needs to become a Christian in the first place. And uh, it may be the case that you've never, never really studied about it. You know, what does it mean to become a Christian in the first place? Well, the New Testament's very clear on, on what that takes to have your sins washed away, to be added to the church. And we're going to extend this opportunity that maybe if you're here tonight and you, you know what you need to do but haven't done it yet, or maybe you're in a position where you are interested and you'd like to learn more and study, well, we're going to offer an invitation, invitation and if you'd like to come forward and respond to, to the gospel, we'll be more than happy to do what we can to help you. Maybe you're here tonight and you've obeyed the gospel but you've not remained faithful. This is going to be an opportunity for you to turn that around. If there's sin in your life, repent of it. And we're, we'll do whatever we can as your brothers and sisters to help you through that. So if you need to respond to the gospel tonight, let's do it right now as we stand and sing.